Hello and welcome to the Sports Think Tank podcast. My name's Andy Reid and I'm the director of the Sports Think Tank and I host these longer chats with leaders across the sport policy system. We cover the sports policy news and we speak to a wide range of leaders, both inside and outside of the sport and physical activity movement, for a longer chat that helps us get behind the details of the challenges we face and hopefully share some of the solutions they have found. We shine the lens on policy, priorities, shared learning and of course on the outcomes. Hopefully we can get under the skin of the latest topical issues and stories and allow you to listen and learn from the lessons these experts have learnt. But we want this to be an interactive podcast, so send us your news, your views, opinions and questions. As you know, we can be found right across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, on the LinkedIn group, Sports Think Tank and of course the sportsthinktank.com website. So, welcome to the latest podcast. So here we are. Good morning. Um, thanks, Eugene, for um, uh, joining us. Um, great opportunity to be, uh, as I just said, the first podcast in the series from the Sports Think Tank Manifesto, the Road to the Manifesto. So you're, you're first up, first chapter in the pamphlet and first podcast. So uh, so well done. And despite wearing your Nottingham uh, top, I'm allowing this to go out on YouTube as well. So there we go, University of Nottingham. Anyway, welcome. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit and just the usual outline with these podcasts is it's a very informal chat through both your work and, more importantly, in this case, the work of the uh, Play England and uh, what you're hoping to achieve in these uh, sort of policy asks. So, so, Eugene, we've known each other, but in 30 seconds, who are you to everybody else? Oh, blimey, that's a tall ask. It is, isn't it? It's always more than 30 seconds, so don't panic. Uh, so, you. Yeah. Eugene um, Minogue, been in and around sport, physical activity, uh, play, uh, a whole range of community work, youth work for, well, all of my, my career, really. Um, predominantly worked in, in local government, um, but most people that the audience are speaking to me uh, will know us, or know me, uh, certainly from my parkour background. So, yeah. um, established Parkour UK back in 2009, uh, ran the NGB for sort of 10 years and stepped away in uh, sort of 2019. Um that was all over and above uh, the day job um, and during that time as well I had a stint at Sport England as well once so it's a common I also set up Parkour Earth the international uh, sort of federation um, and also run a national campaign called No Ball Games spelled K-N-O-W Ball Games so a bit of a play on words so it gives you a bit of a flavour of my background um, yeah and uh, since post pandemic uh, been largely concentrating on the the day job in local government, uh, but returned to uh, the sector, um, joined in Play England um, in April 2023 as interim executive director um, to undertake some strategic reimagining, um, which we're going to talk in part about today. Wow, I think you actually more than managed that, uh, Eugene. And given, Just about. I, I thought it was one of the to- tallest orders to give somebody like yourself <laughs> who has done so much and across so many different parts of the sector, as you said, and held multiple roles at the same time. I think we, we can unpack that a little bit and um, how that sort of operated. But I suppose, yeah, so let's, ju- I suppose, jump in really to the piece around Play England. Now, I know a little bit about it, but only over the history of it. Um, you're now in there. What was the current phrase? Reimagine. Oh, I love that. Reimagineering. Unashamedly stolen from, from Disney. He used to call his uh, artists uh, Imagineers. So it's around That's putting true. creative ideas into practical form. So a lot of people wrongly confuse it with reimagining. Um, and yes. I always have to correct people and say reimagineering. So it's a slightly okay. different different take on it. But yeah, I, I, quite, I quite like it and unashamedly stole it. Um, it's also in my. LinkedIn profile as well, so stuck it on there. So, so where is Play England at the moment? Why do you need reimagineering at this sort of stage in its development and history? And then we can come on to sort of more specifically, you know, sort of going forward, what you're already trying to find to to, to shift the dial on it. And, and let's go back to the fundamentals of why Play is the first podcast and is the the first chapter because I think as you probably say absolutely it, under, it underpins sort of nearly everything else that we're going to talk about isn't it so so yeah it does indeed 
Um, so in terms of Play England, Play England is um, the national charity. It's been around uh, for many years now. Um, and I suppose where Play England is, is symptomatic of play more generally in society, which we're going to talk about. Um, mm. And then also where it's sort of, if you like, it's strategic foothold has been has been lost, uh, particularly in England and more broadly across across the UK. And that is fundamentally connected to um, how play is um, has been lost in society in, a, in sort of the wider sort of concept. Um, so one for a better phrase, it is... So just because uh, that, that's probably what a lot of people are probably thinking of that. I'd imagine most of our podcast audience are sort of have a nostalgic view of play um, and probably would agree with you that play is being lost and but there will be a lot of rose tinted glasses and a bit of prejudice in, in and around that so is there a sort of analysis of how play has been squeezed out of sort of society sorry to interrupt but just these, no no it's sort of fundamental isn't it to the sort of where where are we and where are we going yeah bro- broadly i sort of agree with what you're saying i wouldn't uh, so much agree with the term squeezed out i think it has been lost really um okay. and I, I, partly forgotten with that and I, I think there's there's several things and i think the pandemic which we come on to has compounded and accelerated that um uh, the losing of, of, of play um but equally now we're in a stage where we're accelerating or reminding people um around their obligation to play when i was at parkour one of the most famous quotes that i sort of got attributed to is uh, i said as human beings we've all got an obligation to play um mm-hmm. with that and and we seem to forget that um particularly as uh, the way we've built society now and the way that we've built the current sport and physical activity system um, over the previous couple of decades, yes, that's now changing, and rightly so, um, has, if you like, marginalised play um, mm. in, in that sort of sense. So, you know, when I'm at conferences or other bits and pieces, I always introduce myself, say, Eugene Minogue, Play England, former child. <laughs> Nobody goes... Yes, <laughs> and I think we all forget that we are we are children. We we're, we're inherently built to move and play. It's instinctive, um, particularly for humans, but not exclusively for humans. Um, most animals, dogs, as an example, or uh, most of our pets play. Um, we're built to do it, and even adults, um, we still we still play, but we have um, different ways of play versus versus children. Mm. Um, then we look at more broadly of society, um, particularly the dominance of the car over the last uh, 50 years. It is the overriding reason why play and children have been marginalised um, in society. And this isn't about an anti-car rhetoric. This is around redressing the blend of the two. So as an example, um, I'm an 80s baby. Um, my mum used to kick me out and say, don't come back to the street lights are on. Uh, we used to go out on bikes, play Kirby, rounders. We was in and out of uh, people's upper houses. We had a very large free range of, of movement. Um, we could go around and explore. Our neighbor would go to the park, play on the streets, yeah. um, go to the local football pitch, um, the local youth club, the boxing club, whatever it was, we could go around and, and do it. And I'm sort of that middle generation, if you like. So as an example, there was a piece of research done by Dr. William Bird, which showed the free range of movement, how that shrunk, um, particularly over um, uh, my family's generation. So as an example, my grandfather, not literally my grandfather, but my grandfather's generation, um, their free range of movement was approximately around about eight miles. Um, That got cut in half by the time you're talking about my my father's or my parents' generation, and they got cut in half. Um, my children's free range of movement, we're talking about line of sight now, and this is how much the world has physically struck in terms of free range of movement. And free play is fundamental uh, to children, but more broadly to society um, as well. The overriding reason for that is is the dominance of the car, and that isn't just a the car itself, we're talking about mm. all the infrastructure that comes with that. So how we build our roads, how we build our highways, um, how we build car parks, um, if you like, they dominate an awful lot of the, the public realm and public space. Um, and often it's designed from a driver perspective uh, yeah. from that. And then that bleeds out. So we have very narrow footways and other bits and pieces. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of design lines, the travel lines, the active travel isn't, isn't what it what it should be and certainly what it was when i was a kid now when i was a kid it was slightly different was it still car centric broadly yes but it wasn't as 
bad as what it is now, but there was less cars on the road. So for instance, within uh, my extended family, we was lucky if we had a car in the extended family, let alone in a household. <laughs> and often now you have several in a household. So that sort of dictates what you do. And that squeezes a number of different things, green spaces, trees, um, which you would climb, I did, um, yes. and hence why I started the no, no ball game stuff. So the lady that used to live across the road from my mum's house got the council to put a no ball game sign um, yeah. on my mum's house. Um, that impacted me as a young person. Um, she even got the council to take the tree down, believe it or not, because she was climbing the tree outside the house and other bits. So, right. you know, these things, it's, it, it, the world has physically shrunk, um, certainly for, for, our, for our children. Plus, we've had a lost generation. So through that, we've had a lost generation of children who, frankly, don't know how to play in the way that previous generations did. And there's a number of um, things that are, are coming out of that. We had, um, rightly so, the focus on uh, obesity over the last uh, decade or so. Um, now we've got that compounded with children's mental health issues. In large part, that is because children just don't play in the way that they used to. Now, play is the foundation of all human movement. We can't talk about physical literacy, physical activity, leisure, sport, fitness, exercise, whatever tag label you want to put on it. You can't talk about that without play. It's the fundamental building block um, to how children learn to interact with each other, to move, but not exclusively, but to navigate things like conflict, social interaction, um, navigate rules, make their own rules up um, around around what they do. Um, and I've said on uh, the Play The Way podcast as well, I think we need to remember that we play sport, we don't sport sport. Yes, yeah. And that's what we start need to get back to particularly when it comes to children and young people we need to give them uh, more opportunities to play and to play of their own accord without adult supervision um, and we need to stop sportizing children far too early and again that goes back to how we built the previous sport and physical activity system over the last couple of decades it was all around the sportization and getting people through these pathways and then that's where the bit was lost with play um because there was a yeah. disconnect between sport and play yeah. and then more broadly in the fabric of society we've had the dominance of the cars so we've had less less space for children to play and even less places for children to play so playgrounds particularly but not exclusively um venture playgrounds have virtually been wiped out there was three or four in my community when i was growing up they're virtually not there anymore um play workers have been stripped out of local authorities um with it all so wow. we've got this massive gap um, at the bottom plus it's been compounded by the wider societal issues around children don't know how to play their parents didn't play in the way that I played um, with it all, or you played, or yeah. older generations played. So that's all been lost, um, yeah. and we need to we need to get that get that back from uh, from an activity perspective. But I think also just from a cultural perspective, you know, one of the most emotive um, things that I, I, I tend to do when we talk about uh, play is I say, well what did you call Kirby? And you yeah. get a, a plethora of different answers from different parts of uh, the UK around what, what it is as well. And just an, a small anecdote as well. Um, my youngest daughter, so she's in year six, um, came home from school a, a couple of weeks ago and we was talking about, I said, oh, what was you doing in PE? She said, oh, we was doing this, that and the other. And um, yeah, we was playing playing this, this, this game called... Um, dodgeball and i went oh that sounds like fun i said um <laughs> did you ask mr g who's who's a teacher i said i asked mr g if, he, if, if you could play bench ball she wants what's that so i explained it to her she went back into school mr g's roughly my age um and she came back and she said oh absolutely loved it she said mr g was made up he said he totally forgot about bench ball and he said he's, he's never taught he's been at the school several years but then he sort of got it back into school because of that that nudge and that's the stuff that we're we're losing across the piece but also just makes things fun yeah um yeah. and school is a fundamental place for play as well you know uh the playing before uh the during at lunchtime and after school has all but been lost because we we formalize stuff we sportize stuff um, you know, half the holiday and activities food funds a prime example that is dominated 
by sport. There's very little play elements within that, and that needs needs addressing. But mm. yeah, I'm, I'm sort of going off. No, 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 that, that's, that's really angles. helpful. I think you've encapsulated all of those things. I'm sort of probably hinting at, isn't it? Is that there is research that backs up that sort of view? Because I'm a I was a 70s, 80s child as well and had exactly that same sort of sense. I've just uh, spent a lot of time back at my, my parents' house over the last few months for various reasons. And the street where we played Kirby, where one car would probably pass every, once a day, is now cars parked on the pavements all sides. There is no room in the street to play. And um, even at my dad's funeral recently, there's sort of like friends from the street were there and we recalled the days we were playing on their garage roof that you know and sort of things like that you, you, Absolutely. You know, so there is another layer isn't there in terms of like that sort of safety and we would cycle we would i would cycle miles over the summer holiday to a place in leicestershire um which even as a parent who wants to encourage play was probably a little then reticent with um, my children in later years because of that traffic and car issue isn't the anti-car but actually Absolutely. Just change the dynamics as you say of the society in which we live so there's some very practical stuff but i suppose just coming back to that other piece around and i you know you hear the phraseology don't you, you know sort of health and safety gone mad which is absolutely i really really hate but it does then put, put pressure on other parents and others to probably take over cautious um sort of responsible so risk assessments for absolutely everything that happens yeah just probably put a bit of pressure mentally on parents to think they have to risk assess everything they do rather than as you probably know allowing children to explore and make those mistakes themselves so there's quite a lot actually in there isn't there that has made play uh, i say squeezed out you don't like that i, I agree there's it's probably even more than that isn't it it's almost been designed out of large parts of, uh, of our life and and uh, just be, i'll let you come back and then we'll go through some of the details but increasingly mm. I, I quite like that not having to sportify everything i mean i, I play sport but to enjoy it, uh, I'm not. That's yeah. why I'm not very good because I don't mind if we win or lose as long as we've enjoyed it. And I think the a theme across all the other pieces now is that people are getting back to the idea that we should just have fun whilst doing sport, not put it on the pathway. There's still quite a lot of people in the sector. We need to convince that that's not what this is all about. Is that it's, especially with my sport development hat on, you just want to get people to be involved, and it might be other skills they learn. They're not going to be, we're not putting people on a pathway to run a marathon. You know, that's just not what it's about for a lot of people. It is about that just being able to move again. So, so they're the challenges, Eugene, and, and yeah. there's quite a lot stacked up against you. you. We started off, and I do apologize, I cut across you, but just describing, you know, from my days when we helped set, set up Play England, and, and I hated it when you said it was set up a long time ago, because I was around <laughs> at the time, and, and in my memory, it still seems quite recent, but you're right. So just that sort of evolution, we sort of recognized this was happening, um, and then, you know, Play England's been on the scene, what are the measures, and we'll come on to some of the more specific ones around place efficiency, other pieces, but what can we do to turn this tide, I suppose, is the question, because sometimes you can feel a bit, oh, that's all too much. Yeah, I suppose just before we get into that, there's a couple of things that I think would be useful to sort of sort of point out. We've published that, so playing and published a, uh, a report on Play Day earlier this, this summer around trends in street play and sort of showing um, how it's dramatically declined particularly over the last uh, 70 years so it's a longitudinal sort of uh, study that we've been doing since uh, 2013 and shows how much that has actually shrunk and going back to your point um, has it been designed out yes I'm not sure it's been deliberately designed out um, no. but often we're designing stuff from an engineer's perspective we're designing it from a driver perspective um, and from particularly from an adult perspective um, and one of the things I champion is around uh, uh, there's a program called Urban 95, which is around designing the city through uh, the eyes of an average height of a four year old, 95 centimetres, hence why it's called Urban 95. So it really changes the dynamic around um, how you look at the streetscape uh, with it all. Um, yeah. You mentioned risk assessment uh, there as well. One of the other things, uh, big wins we got uh, earlier this year was a new uh, ISO or an international standard. Um, uh, published um, on benefit risk assessment. Um, that now, this isn't exclusively about play. This is about play, sport, recreation, and this is around how there's inherent benefits within risk um, yes. and around how we should use uh, benefit risk assessment or risk benefit, whichever way you want to do it. So when I was at Parkour um, before the ISO was published earlier this year, I used to refer to it as risk benefit, right? So we changed the title and called it yes. benefit risk assessment. So this is around how you look at things in the round um, and we can't make things... Um, 
you know, as sterile as they currently are. There is inherent risk. And with any sporting activity, there's inherent sporting risk. And that's there's a value in that. And that's something that we need to need to embrace. So, again, I'd encourage people to read it. Um, the, the actual tech equal title with the ISO 4980 2023 in benefit risk assessment but I've covered uh, you know people to to sort of look at that it covers uh, everything from play sports recreation facilities activities and equipment as well so it gives you some really good practical advice around um, how to how to uh, risk benefit um, yes. assess no, activities exactly. and facilities because we all know when we're doing risk, I mean, I can really push this when I'm on boards and things, but it's about your risk appetite, isn't it? You're not going to ever reduce all risk, but it's your appetite for risk. And actually, sometimes you might want to push that envelope further uh, than others Absolutely. in this area. That sounds really, really sensible, doesn't it? Is that you understand Absolutely. Risk, but you're willing to take it. Yeah, and we can give it, you know, playing and we can give people practical advice of how to put that into practical implementation yeah. as well. Because I know some of these documents can be quite technical for people to to, to read, um, but there is a really in front of it. To you, you put half the yeah. Not, you? <laughs> it's a really straightforward document to sort of um, sort of take take forwards, really. So I'd really encourage people to sort of go and go and have a look at that um, and sort of uh, embrace. Uh, and take it take it forwards and it's it's broadly applicable to the, the wider sport and physical activity sector um which is where we're now strategically repositioning play to be aligned to um uh, but not exclusively in uh, so for for previous sort of uh periods play has been broadly aligned with uh education that won't yeah. change but we we want to uh, make sure we have a strategic foothold within uh sport and physical activity for for the reasons that I've outlined and we'll continue to as we as we sort of go through the discussion really and how young, in, in terms of, I know in the past, particularly Sport England, they sort of trust in schools, as you said, it's always been a little bit difficult for the sector wider to sort of go to early years. Yet clearly, you know, reading some of your stuff and, you know, if anybody wants more detail of the stuff that you're pumping out, just follow Eugene on LinkedIn. It is a resource every day of stuff from around the world. Eugene isn't alone. There are people around the world who are pushing this and some great examples from, um, you know, continental partners in particular. But in terms of you know, what we've been talking about, I assume, you know, where, where play is starts as babies, as you said. So just as your remit go that far and how do you work as you say probably outside of our sector and other sort of specific bits around early years intervention because it's quite often head teachers say this don't they by the time the children arrives at rising fours fives it's too late that's a lot of this damage i'm happy to call that but has already been done yeah absolutely so early years is fundamental to play that's that's how children learn to move navigate um conflict interact socially interact with other children and uh, adults as well um, so there's all the elements of play the creative sort of side the art sort of side um, the therapeutic sort of side to play in hospitals but also in public spaces such as prisons as well it's it's key but i think for for today we're sort of focusing on the uh, the active side of, of yes. the play which uh, play is uh, you know fundamental piece to it but it's important to point out that isn't yeah just play in its in its yeah um, yeah broadest sense of the term um so i think the, the early years the foundation years are are key with that and again this goes back to the wider societal sort of pieces and parents and generations knowing how to play and where they can play you know there's a wrong assumption now with certain um children of a younger age that they have to go to a place to play i.e a playground or a play center or it needs to be done in a school as opposed to just freely played out in the street or in the car garden um, or with their friends um, or going out on the bikes and having that free range of movement um, and that's where I think us as society and us as adults really need to take a grown-up pragmatic approach and really take a step a step back for far too long we've been um, supervising or intervening and one of the things I said on other podcasts a lot of the time we just we just need to get out of the way let children be children and, and, and do what they do does, does there need to be some um, guardrails with that? Yes, absolutely. But not as many as what we perceive we need uh, with that. Otherwise, we've ended up where, where we are now. Um, 
And I think that's the bit that we need to try and try and undo. And I think there's a real opportunity for that at the moment, particularly given um, the street, the strategic repositioning of sport, and physical activity. Um, the sector is changing and rightly so. Um, and I think there is a, a real coming together around how can play can uh, support uh, and integrate with that and vice versa. Uh, there's a lot of expertise and there's particularly our expertise around uh, the early years and how we get and keep children moving. You know, the active live survey, um, the number one activity uh, that children children do, which is, the, you know, it's no surprise to anybody, particularly to me, is active play. Um, you know, I remember p people always say to me, oh, you know, have you got any data around how many children play? I, I always go to people, you tell me a child that doesn't. <laughs> so yeah. but this is the thing but when, 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 you know that is a very broad question and it evokes a very um uh interesting response from people because immediately people go back to their child and they go oh yeah yeah, yeah. i used to play but that how much a child plays is very different nowadays versus to what it was yeah. um so there's a churchillian quote i will um, refer to i'm probably going to get it wrong but the farther you look back the farther forwards you can see and what i mean by that is the solutions to our problems that we've got today particularly around play but not exclusively around children and movement and activity we had we had the solutions the problem is we've designed them out forgot about them um or allowed other things to start dominating our society with it all so we need to redress that blend i yeah. don't like the term balance because you know it means different things in different places hence why the term blend for me works works better really um you know and there are things that that have been been around um you know the, the, as an example the united nations convention on the rights of the child or the uncrc uh, has been around since 1980 uh, the uk is a, a a signatory to that article 31 as one of the examples is the child's right to play recreation cultural activities with that but we haven't meaningfully put that into practice in, in society. Um, yeah. Hence why one of the things we're asking for within the manifesto and our big overriding ask uh, for Play England um, is the introduction of play sufficiency legislation in England um, yes. with that. So I was now, you can unpack that for us, Eugene, sort of, because it's a, it's, a it's a great word and it's a, or a great term, <laughs> doesn't it? It sort of, sort of makes sense. But I know you've got some detail behind that, you know, sort of around spaces and places, workforce and, and that provision as well. So I suppose it's just sort of un, unpacking, as you've done in the, the pamphlet, just what that really sort of could look like in a, in a practical sense as well, isn't it? And I understand there's, there's a willingness to move in this direction. And, and I agree with you. I think there's a little bit more people have... We, yeah, I think that the sector and other parts of sector are recognising we need, need to get back a little bit in some of the damage that we've done to the way that society works. And particularly, you mentioned it at the beginning, um, probably know much more about this than me, but around mental health as well as physical literacy and movement. Uh, the the two have, have hit a bit of a post-COVID crisis, haven't they, where we recognise um, that certain groups of people were able to enjoy lockdown and movement and as I quite explained to a lot of my middle class friends who were enjoying lockdown and going for walks, that wouldn't have been the same if you were homeschooling in a tower block in, a, in, a, in an urban centre um, with four children, you know, not able to go out. They said that sometimes policymakers are too aware of their world and not the lived experience of others. So Absolutely. that's quite a long winded way of allowing you to sort of unpack the detail of, OK, we get that, you get the problems. What, what are we going to do about some of those in a practical way? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and unpack it for, for, for people. I think there's a bit of an important context here to sort of sort of understand uh, sure. with it all. So the irony is us calling on government to introduce legislation yes. <laughs> to provide a statutory duty for children to be able to play is damning in its own right, but nonetheless is reflective of where we've got to as a system. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I get your um, fundamental so is it needed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Is it is it needed given where we are? Yes, absolutely. Um, and just just to, to sort of give some wider context uh, to it. So um, broadly, place efficiency legislation would establish a, uh, a statutory responsibility or statutory guidance, particularly for local authorities uh, to follow in order to comply with and make sure that they assess and provides, provides sufficient play and recreation opportunities and conduct 
regular place efficiency reports in the same way that they do for for other things um, as an example and i'll come through onto onto some of those practical examples which is already the case for things like sports and leisure facilities uh, so sport england has um, statutory guidance uh, within that under the assessing opportunities um, uh, opportunities guidance uh, as well for sport and uh, leisure facilities um, so we're asking for the same sort of piece uh, yeah. uh, in relation to to play now the, the wider context of this is um, an equivalent duty has been in place in Wales for well over a decade uh, it was introduced in Scotland in May and very coincidentally yesterday the Scottish government published their planning guidance around this so this is all really really timely Additionally, um, back in September, uh, Save the Children UK published a report called uh, What About the Children? How the UK's decision makers consider children and young people during the COVID pandemic. Um, amongst the recommendations um, is a uh, call to introduce place efficiency legislation. So again, sort of echoing um, our wider sort of call around that. Um, so the report sort of outlines various sort of things and said the place efficiency and national place um, uh, strategy is also uh, highlighted in there. So they're all things that Play England are actively working on. But it was really reassuring to sort of see see that report come out and, and, and echo the stuff that we're, we're doing. Um, <clears throat> so some more detail around as, as, as to why. So the current plan in the system is, is in England particularly is extremely weak when it comes to children and young people um, and particularly play and recreation opportunities. Sport and leisure is covered. That's the formalised pitches, wickets, courts, tracks, fields, leisure centres. That's all covered. Yeah. The bit that falls squarely between the cracks is in that is your playgrounds, your multi-use games there areas, your skate parks, all the informal recreational play uh, facilities that are out there, which are fundamental to getting and keeping children and families active, um, but provides um, space for children to meet, congregate, in interact, and families um, as well. Um, there's lots of work that needs to be done more broadly around that, around um, accessibility, inclusivity, uh, particularly making sure that those spaces are better suited to women and girls um, and teenagers, um, teenage girls particularly. Um, so making sure that we we sort of bring bring that in. So the idea behind this um, currently, um, so if you look at the, the current national planning policy framework, there is statutory protection within there for bats and newts. Um, within there. So you may have heard earlier this summer around Boris Johnson trying to build a swimming pool at his place and it got thwarted by the great crested newts. Uh, by contrast, there's no statutory protection within the NPPF around children and young people. That is damning within that. There's one re reference within there and that is in the provision of homes, but there's no statutory protection around you, local authorities should, as part of their, their planning process, take into account uh, children and young people in the space, but also the place that they need. And I'll come on to sort of what we would like in England with place efficiency legislation, building upon the very good work that has been done in Wales uh, over the last decade and Scotland more recently. But we want to go further in, in England uh, with that. So there's a number of things that we're sort of calling on really some really good stuff in there I, I suppose i suppose the only thing at this stage in the current political cycle um is the pressure on local authorities um i mean you know you've worked in that sector for a long time and i don't think we need to stray too far into that at this sort of stage but there is a reality sort of check isn't there around where like you said i used to work it next to the play team when i worked at leicester city council as a group of them I, I ran several of those adventure playgrounds and they've all now gone the play team's gone the neighborhood team have all disappeared you know the, um so you know a part of that picture that you've painted is local authorities being squeezed to now probably only being able to afford um dealing with adult social care child social care homelessness and its statutory responsibilities so uh, again that's probably another follow-up isn't it to this is for all of us is that we're asking people to do stuff who aren't able to really deliver it so we can unpack that probably um, across all of the chapters that are asking <laughs> so, so where i mean how do no, you, you, that? I mean, cause you, you live it every day don't you in your other roles 
Absolutely, and I know how how um, dire the situation is, particularly in local government, and how it's been it's been cut to the bone for various sort of uh, different yeah. reasons, whether that be uh, austerity, whether it be post COVID, whether it be financial sort of settlements. Um, and also the expertise has been stripped out as well you know and it, this isn't a just a play but play is one of the things one of the first things that went uh, yeah. with that and then obviously the squeeze on on leisure and physical activity uh, you know school sports partnerships um, as we all know you know all of these things sort of have, have fallen by the wayside uh, for various different um sort of political reasons um but one of the, the sort of framing around the manifesto ask uh, was in there was a no cost policy ask yes, now this that. is a, yeah. yeah so this is the introduction of place efficiency legislation is a no policy ask and that really sung to my core because one of the things that i i harp on about in local government and also uh, when i've been doing stuff nationally particularly with with parkour both uh, domestically and internationally is if you get policy right Mm. the funding then follows and what do i mean by that so sometimes it isn't around just central government funding or other bits and pieces at a more local level as an example um if you get the nppf or the national planning policy framework right that then sits into yeah. local authorities with their local plan so that's their local version of their, their planning bible if you like um that then leverages things like developer contributions yeah. so when development is taking place in a patch there should be an element that comes rightly so into uh, play and recreation facilities. Now, sport has that um, already because of the, the statutory sort of guidance from Sport England. Sport England is a statutory consultee when it comes to those sort of elements. Um, is that as sharp as it could be? No. And I think we've missed an opportunity, particularly with the, the, the recent sort of levelling up bill, to sharpen the pencil on uh, the national plan and policy framework, but also potentially a missed opportunity around place efficiency legislation. But we've yeah. got that within yeah. the manifesto ask. And I'll come on to levelling up inquiry as well. So there's another uh, opportunity there no, for, for us that. as well. Answers the fundamental, as you said, as you know, it was one of the asks of this is that, you know, given the current climate, there isn't going to be new money about. So we need to think about these sort of in a fresh well, way. The only, thing, was, was, yeah, you know. the only thing I'd add to that is, you know, as an example, in Scotland, they introduced this legislation in, in uh, and they put their money where their mouth is. They put, they put yeah. £50 million pounds, um, out there to improve parks and open spaces, um, not exclusively play, but across the board. But that was as, as a, a potential consequence of place efficient legislation being introduced in Scotland. So it gives you an idea of what central government can do and also how you can leverage local money as well plus there's a yeah. lot, an awful lot of funders out there fcc is one example yeah. um who put a lot of money into play and recreation facilities london marathon foundation have yeah. um, done an awful lot of play facilities in london as well so there's an opportunity there but we need to demonstrate the need for it and this is what place efficiency is is largely about yeah no that's, that's brilliant so sorry yes I, I did cut across you again but just uh, just to reinforce our major point really is that yeah you're right there isn't no one's going to write a big check, but there are ways of unlocking funding through policy changes. And that's, you know, that's why it's great to have you on here. Because it's sort of Absolutely. And I think yeah, the, yeah. the other advantage of policy is um, it should um, where it works properly. And a prime example is uh, Leeds City Council have gone down the whole hog of place efficiency um, uh, assessments at the moment. They're doing some great work now. They're not waiting for the legislation because they are a child friendly city. And already yeah. you can see that around the wider benefits that they're having with their public health team, their active leads team, the space and place with the highways and transport, introducing play streets and other uh, bits and pieces across, across the board. And that's the benefit of policy. If you get it, you bring other expertise to the table um, yeah. around how you then co design that and get that right from the perspective and the broader things uh, you know children are an indicator species broadly if you get it right for children particularly at the early years it then looks after every well most people everywhere everywhere else in, in, in society and um, so it works works really well so in terms of um the place efficiency sort of ask uh within that the reason the main reason we're asking for for this is to make sure that it brings the uncrc um particularly article 31 into meaningful practice um in the in in, in England um, and we're woefully lagging behind now particularly Wales and, and Scotland and we like I said earlier we want to build on that good work that they've they've done and that they've pioneered um, so broadly what we're asking for is the introduction of place efficiency legislation but there's three key headlines within there which we're sort of asking for um, to sort of 
build on the existing work that Scotland and Wales have done, but take it slightly further uh, in England. Um, this is an exhaustive list, but it's just just headline sort of stuff. So spaces and places so it's, yeah. this isn't just around playgrounds yes they're fundamentally important as our adventure playgrounds as a school playgrounds places to play for children are fundamental but also space to play and within our public realm within our highways within our parks and open space within our high streets uh, within our communities um, children must be a fundamental part of how we design the very fabric of our public realm um, and frankly we've designed that out and it isn't just children there was um trees have almost disappeared from new new estates and uh, bits that have been built and we're not replacing them in the same way that that, that we used to and we're starting to to understand that and trees are great for a whole range of different things climate um, and other bits of pieces. but fundamentally um children climb trees <laughs> if we ain't got trees for them to climb then you know we're not gonna uh, master that art yes i think you know it's one of the things we all smile when we think about climbing trees we've all done it as a as a kid but that's been drum uh, out of us as a society, but it's certainly, it's, you know, it's a right of passage, like right the bike. Yeah, yeah. You should have climbed the tree. I was just about to go on you know? a walking so meeting it, with a, a friend from the sector and a walk in, in a park that has men, I could point out the trees as a child <laughs> that were part of your growing up and which ones you've fallen out of. And Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, right. spaces and places for play and recreation in the broadest sense of term, because yeah. how children play. Um, differs over over their, their their sort of life course uh with it all so places like multi-use games areas are key mm -hmm. for for children as they transition from playgrounds um into more formalized or organized uh sort of activities but at the same time there's a lot of work that's got to be done around as i mentioned earlier inclusivity accessibility yeah. particularly uh for young teenage uh girls as well yeah. the second element that we're, we're calling for is workforce now sport yeah. has gone through an awful lot of pain particularly over the last decade of repositioning its workforce since been doing some great great sterling work around uh taking that forward to professionalizing the, the sort of sector and, and, and moving that forward play has sort of lost its way on that front if i'm being frank and that's something that we've we've got to do so we've got to re-establish um the recognition of a play worker um as a profession in its own right because it is um and also make sure we've got to provide uh, robust professional standards. We've got to provide um, nationally recognized qualifications again for that because they've, again, they've sort of all but disappeared. Uh, um, we've got to make sure we provide the regulation and registration um, around that in the same way that sport is moving to now with um, the workforce sort of registration sort of piece yeah. as well. And that's fundamental, particularly for us working with children and young people in the early years, particularly. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to, um, if you like, go off the coattails of sport and the pain that they've they've been through with with that and accelerate what we need to do but also bring an awful lot to the table um around that there's an awful lot that sport and physical activity can learn from us um, yeah. as you can see through the children's coaching collaborative and play their way and sport wanting to to reintroduce the fund rightly so so we can help with that and vice versa and then there's some common ground obviously between the two um and then common ground across a number of different sectors so things like safeguarding is you know common mm -hmm. across the piece um, yeah. you know we could we could really work to, to leverage that and then the third element is around leveraging the first two so the provision of play so high quality inclusive play services um being yeah. reintroduced back across england so that before the during the after school the informal and as a kid you know i used to say this quite a lot when i was at parkour there's an awful lot of formality in the informality um of play with that we need play workers back in our schools in the same way that we need high quality p and school sports provision um but we need people on the playgrounds who can help facilitate this stuff or just nudge children to do things in the way that they do particularly before school during school but also that after school the wraparound sort of piece as well as opposed to okay you're going off to football and you're going off to netball or people just doing the, the, the school run and shooting off to gymnastics or the dance club or whatever it may be um, we need to value that after school play type thing um, not just on the school playground but also on the way home as well and that comes back to the, yeah. the wider sort of public realm yeah. and then making sure that we have high quality play provision during the holidays alongside and or with sport 
yeah they should be working hand in glove um uh, along the piece and you know you go back to and again play their way sort of podcast has done some some great work around this you always ask children and young people what's the bit that they most enjoy about the sport it's always the the bit at the end the typically at the end where they get to play um yeah. but i think that's a way of leveraging people to try different activities um yeah talk about you we've spoke briefly around physical literacy um sort of element as well so playing the play their role in that with the consensus statement it's a definitely a huge step in the right right direction is there more to do yes um absolutely and i think play is the precursor to physical literacy but also it has a key role to play yeah. around um, developing our children's uh, physical li- yeah. physical literacy and i think that's something that we've we've forgotten um with that play is often trivialized um in a way that sport used to be hobbyized many years yeah. ago sport has come out of that and is it, it is rightly so now seen as a, a a profession in its in its own right play is sort of lost that, and that's essentially what we're doing around the strategic reimagining with play england so that's the sort of the broad ask around around what we're doing um i've sort of articulated some of some of the why really um and that's that's what we're keen to sort of uh, see take forward. Hence, why it's our manifesto ask it to be a key plank of uh, the new strategy that we're developing. So we're, we're in the process of just early wire framing um, a new play strategy for England, not a play England strategy, yes. uh, a play strategy for England. So we're doing that, and we we've been going out to a wider consultation, or what I like to call a challenge and curiosity network. Uh, in early 24 to help people sort of um, take it apart, put it back together again, making sure it is robust, but also realistic and pragmatic around where we currently are. And we know it's going to take uh, the best part of a decade to redress some of the blend that has gone the opposite way with it all. Um, So in terms of the how, um, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the detail will be in the manifesto document that that you're sort of reading. So I'll I'll, I'll encourage people to go read it, but I'll give some some ideas with uh, with that as well. So I spoke about some of the stuff with the spaces and places. The practical example is around, you know, could potentially Sport England's remit be broadened to plug that gap um, around the the bit that falls in between the formalised sport and physical activities uh, facility sorry uh, the indoors and outdoors to cover things like playgrounds multi-use areas uh, multi-use games areas skate parks uh, park or parks uh, all the stuff that is typically free to access um, in our parks and open spaces but then more broadly and it's an interesting time because obviously active traveling and um, not that long ago have got statutory consultee status so they're covering the broader public realm again could they look at it from a slightly different angle from children and young people uh, with that and I think there's a real coming together. So there's a real emergence at the moment around learn to ride facilities, which are mm. uh, a blend of a playground, typical playground, but a space and place to learn or to do things such as your bike ability. But also, I think it's a real opportunity for us moving forward with micro, micro mobility transport as well. Um, children and young people hopefully will travel in a very different way than, than we do, hopefully um, by bikes, e-bikes e-scooters whatever they're going to be called sort of moving forward so these facilities give a dedicated space and place that mimic the public realm but also have a fundamental play element with it as well so there's a real real sort of opportunity uh, um within that as well when it comes to the workforce um, as i spoke around it's um you know it, it, it's around the professional standards and getting that proper recognition around play workers in the broadest sense of the term um, this isn't just around the after school club or the other bits with it this is around play therapy workers that do fantastic work in in hospitals with very sick and terminally ill uh, children and young people but also um the prison sector as well we're working with um the alliance of sport uh, around uh, activities within uh, the prison scape as well yeah. um, and making sure that play is a fundamental part part of that as well so when children come to see um prisoners that they that, that they can have that um interaction in and around around play um as well um and then also that you know leaning into some of the stuff that is already out there so the, the the government's strategy around get active there's a heavy focus around workforce so again can we go off the coattails of what sport have been doing to sort of bring that bring that bring that with us um yeah and again the provision sort of stuff you know building on things such as um the uh, school sport and activity plan which uh, obviously uh, is around the two hours of high quality 
sort of PE. Should we have a similar sort of mask around play, making sure that that is built in and timetabled? I know this is the irony, you know, you're, you're sort of smiling. It's like, we need timetable play? Yeah, it is a contradiction, but that's where we've got to as a society. Um, yeah, and yeah. I think that's the bit that we need to we need yeah. to just be a little bit more cognizant of yeah. because it's it's one of those things you forget about it and it isn't on the yeah. schedule. It gets it, it gets it lost. Replace it, would it, Eugene? It's not as though saying no. you now can't play the other sort of thirty hours that you've got, but actually timetabling, particularly with the pressures on from social media, from sort of uh, school curricula, etc. There is a lot of pressure that even in your, um, uh, my kids have been a bit like one one isn't and what is, but in their downtime, the need to study and do extra work. Whereas I just say just go out and then just relax and um, play. So it's, it's giving permission Absolutely. to do something that should be natural. But as you said, we just need to rebalance that, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And blending it back into particularly yeah. the school day, but also I think just as us as as family um, with that all, you know, the, you know, sc- snow days are, are, are great. It's, the, it's the, one of the few times you see sort of everybody out in your street or it's everybody sort of piles out. Yeah, this is all about adults, older people, yeah. children all come out and have, have, have some fun. So but that, that's that's the nudge that we sometimes yeah. just need to, to go and do it. And the, the timetabling is that is that nudge. So as an example, one of the things that we're asking for uh, within there as well one of the ideas we've got is around uh could schools um program play as homework um, or a social prescription for that because if mm-hmm. um, when your children come home with a piece of paper and go you know mum or dad i've got to do my maths timetable or other bits and pieces you often sit down at the table and take them through it another bit you imagine if someone came home and said we've got to play for half an hour outside yeah what that would do to potentially could do to families or other bits and then you've got children nagging you to say oh yeah. you know we've done it with other bits it's just a small thing um, a yeah. small idea but potentially could have a big sort of impact but we want to make sure that, that is baked back in uh, to yeah. school but then also the wider fabric of society yeah. and i think there's a real opportunity particularly with um the place based interventions that supporting them driving forwards the active partnerships uh, that are out there as uh, as well, the existing or what's left of SSPs that are out there, uh, school sports partnerships, and how how we can leverage that. Um, but just getting it back into into people's mentality, really. Um, mm. So there's a lot of stuff that we're currently doing as well yeah. um, around the potential uh, implementation of play sufficiency legislation. So as I said, we're we're putting ourselves in a high state of preparedness. So again, we're going through that strategic reimagining to realign ourselves. Um, with the sport physical activity sector but not exclusively um we're doing a lot of work around uh, supporting local authorities uh with the potential introduction of that but also just nudging them particularly around yeah. their play and their physical activity stuff and one of the other things that i think um we're doing even if this doesn't get introduced which i hope it does um we're, we're sort of working with the consultants that do an awful lot of the built facility strategies uh, and yeah. the playing pit strategies to say there's the gap there. Don't forget about that gap and nudge the local authority to, to what they do. But without that statutory obligation, some may choose not to do it. The good ones will choose to do it, such yeah, as leads. Yeah. Um, and they're realizing that the, the sort of wider, wider sort of benefits of, of, of that. So there's, there's a real opportunity. Um, talking of opportunities, the other one that I would like to highlight, and I'm conscious this is <laughs> going to go out in the, in the new year, is we've got a leveling up. We've managed to secure a leveling up um inquiry um so this is looking at children young people in the built environment um so evidence is be, being taken up until the second of january but it's looking at the, the experiences of children young people within the uh built environment uh children young people within the planning system best practice and evaluation cross governmental working um there we say that um but th- this is the stuff that we're looking at so people across uh particularly the play sector but also more broadly across uh local authorities and also the sport and physical activity sector we encourage people to sort of submit evidence with that and again this is supporting the wider call around supply play sufficiency legislation it will help redress that blend that has gone too far the opposite opposite sort of way so the timing around all of this is great and it's fantastic that we're sort of in the manifesto sort of uh, document, but also chapter number one, and rightly so. Um, so <laughs> fantastic. 
Yeah. Not, not even under a great deal of pressure from that, Eugene. It just made sense to all this. We're going to cover, you know, from, from birth to old age, but it's also from play to elite sport. You know, it's the, the thing about our sector is that it's, it's so broad and varied and sometimes other bits of it don't understand it. So hopefully in more ways than anything else, even if we've not reached the wider audience, you're doing all that great work to move the legislation on. But hopefully it's just been an education to other parts of our sector a wider sector about the importance and understanding of it. And I think you've highlighted a few little bits there. I sort of jotted a few down, but actually just sometimes the word play um, in a sector that has become so professional, almost seen as something that happens naturally without much intervention. And, and we'd, as you say, this horrible contradiction is that that's where we would like to be. It's almost like the success of your job, I, I, I get, get from this sort of chat, is that you make yourself, there's a lot of people, isn't it? You make yourself unemployed you get back to the point where play is so integral to everything that we don't have to bang on about it or legislate for it or to put programs in place or train the workforce. There, there's yeah. an end point, isn't there, where, you know, you make yourself redundant and that's probably your re-engineering sort of stuff, isn't it, or where you would like to get to that we, I think that Churchill quote you gave, it is a little bit, um, well, we, I always think you should always look forward but it's amazing with a bit of corporate memory how some of the stuff from the past you can bring and modernise into a into the current sort of world. Um, it didn't always uh, roast into glasses that were talked about. And what's been really helpful, Eugene, from my point of view, is that you've got a lot of research, the stuff that you put out that demonstrates all of this sort of um, game say stuff that we say. There is a lot of, uh, of, of this behind it. And there is some hope. I mean, that's the other thing I think I've, I've sort of come across from this morning. As always, your enthusiasm and willingness and the sort of the battles that you're willing to sort of take on do mean that I'm quite confident that something will happen. Um, and given all those other sort of pressures, mental health and physical physical activity, um, a different way of thinking, even across the other parts of the sector, looking at health rather than just doing sport for its own sake. Uh, Absolutely. I do feel there is, I keep feeling this, but I feel there's a, there's a time um, where your time has come um, and will be part of that. I'm sure hopefully that's what you're feeling as as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it definitely feels like the time is right. I just hope um, that mistakes of Christmas past aren't made um, with that all, whereby we just miss the opportunity uh, with it all because we, 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 we get a little bit dithery, if you like, yeah. with it all and we tend to flip-flop around stuff as opposed to just going, let's just get on with this. Yeah. And I think that's that's where we've, we've got to as a, a, a sector, particularly sport and physical activity, We've had so many years of talking about what we need to do. And I yeah. think where the sector is now, can we just get on with it? Yeah. And, you know, and this, this, this is where it feels like we've, we've played. I think we've stepped in at the right time. Um, my, my, my sort of primary purpose role here at Play England is to strategically re realign it with sport physical activity to add to that sector. Um, but also bring the, the the recognition and credibility that play deserves in its own right. But also take that out into other sectors, whether that is uh, Active Travel England and DFT, our existing relationships with the Department of Education, the schools and wider sort of societal sort of pieces. Yes, absolutely. But I think we need a strategic foothold within sport, physical activity and reminds people that play is the intrinsic thing that binds all of that together. Um, you know, going back to that quote, you play baseball, you don't sport sport. We're players, you know, whatever sport, I'm wearing this top that says player layer on it. So, you know, these, these are things that we just forget um, around it all. And ultimately, you know, even as adults, you you were doing it, you know, things like, um, you know, park run or others, people do that because they enjoy it. Yeah. Yes, it's timed and others, but they go out and they do it because they, they, they fundamentally enjoy it. Um, and that's a form of, of play, really. And I think there's a huge, the, the big opportunity around all of this is the glare and the obvious one. It is the early years. And I think that's the glaring gap, particularly in the governmental strategy, um, less so in Sport England, but it's still a gap nonetheless because of how the system has built, been built over previous decades. It's been mm. geared towards a teenage plus. And I think yeah. us as Play England have got a real opportunity to step in that, add some value, some expertise uh, to the wider sector, but also to learn from the sector and take things into, into our sector as well. So... Yeah timing is absolutely right but i just hope that we don't make the same same mistakes previously like <laughs> with parkour 
I'm, sure I'm waiting too long. long. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there was some along the way, but um, we can, uh, you know, the, the, I think your enthusiasm and willingness to understand how you change the system, um, and you're entirely right, is that uh, all of those things, It's it, this is a genuine piece of cross-government working. Um, Absolutely. It really strikes through this, isn't it? It's, it's, you know, the, the stuff that you do outside DCMS is far more important than the stuff we do inside, and I think there's quite a lot. I think people are moving to a better understanding of that. Um, across the sports sector is that uh, there are other parts of government that are much more important. Um, uh, as always, do you know what? I, mean, that, I, I said to you, didn't I? I said, well, it, it, it won't do long because it's, uh, you know, <laughs> but as always, in any discussion with you, Eugene, there's time has absolutely flown. Uh, we've covered quite a bit. I suppose this is the chance to um, bring to life. I know people do read stuff, but increasingly people do listen to things. And I think your enthusiasm doesn't always come across in the words, does it, when you're having to do a formal document or a submission to a select committee? So how no. can I call you for evidence um, uh, to to, uh, to back up what you're saying to the uh, select committee? Hopefully. In the hopefully. I really hope they do, because yeah. you know, I think the passion you brought across, the detail, the level of thinking that's gone into this, this is something the rest of us need to take a bit more seriously. And, you know, I've reached out to you for those purposes because I do think it underpins everything else that comes in the, the next 28 chapters. So well done Hopefully. on enthusing us and making sure, as I say to people, if you're not already following Eugene on LinkedIn, follow. follow you know, I don't know how many updates. My rambling. Today, but it, does, it does feel as though you're an entire resource on your own, Eugene. <laughs> yeah, I do spot a number of different things. But the, the other thing, just to point out, Andy, yes, I'm sort of amplifying what yeah. an awful lot of people in our sector are doing. This isn't just just me as well, particularly on things like the Leveling Up yeah. Inquiry. There's an awful lot of people that have been banging a drum on that front, and we've been standing shoulder to shoulder. Thankfully, we've got the inquiry. And where we're repositioning playing is to be that hilarocracy of the whole of the sector, really, yeah. and to advocate for the sector. That's that's yeah. that's our job. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I just want to give a hat tip to everybody in the, in the play sector that is doing the, the, the sort of sterling work and um, I'm being able to present it which is which is yeah. useful so. and I know from the roles I have that's where you, you, you end up not speaking on behalf of but helping to amplify people who are busy yeah. doing and don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to do all of this sort of top level ask sort of stuff you do it on their behalf and you do it so well so can I thank you for being with us today thanks for listening to the latest podcast hopefully you found it helpful and you've gained some insights from our guest if you have enjoyed it today, it would be really helpful to hit the like button and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. As always, feel free to pop over to any of our social media channels to comment or ask a question. Or sign up to our monthly newsletter at sportsthinktank.com. If you're interested in supporting our work at the Sports Think Tank, again, just head over to the website or drop me an email. Thanks and see you again next time. <laughs>